Hello, and welcome to the Mighty Oaks Show. I'm Jeremy Stolnicker, the Executive Director of the Mighty Oaks Foundation, here with Chad Robichaud, the founder and president of the Mighty Oaks Foundation. Who's going to introduce our special guest today? <laughs> all right. He's going to, yeah. and then he apparently forgot. So that's yeah, all right. Introduce our guest today. Yeah. Well, Jeremy usually does it, but I'm super pumped to do it because uh, our friend Tim Kennedy is with us. And uh, I don't think I need to give you an introduction, Tim, but I'm going to anyway uh, because hopefully we get you in front of some, some new people that hadn't met you yet and they can uh, learn about the exploits of Tim Kennedy <laughs> and, his, uh, and his pink straw. So <laughs> well, Tim Tim's a, uh, was a top five uh, UFC fighter. Uh, Ranger, Sniper, Green Beret, uh, just an incredible military history, and then uh, did some more stuff uh, beyond the military, uh, really in the public realm. I was on a History Channel on Hunting, Hunting Hitler, two, ep two seasons? Uh, three. Three, three seasons? <laughs> Seven. They hit that one, 27. <laughs> <laughs> so lots of seasons on Hunting Hitler. Uh, I don't know if they found him yet, but, uh, and then he was on Discovery Channel on a show called Hard to Kill, where actually people tried to murder Tim in each episode and uh luckily you're still alive and with us today and uh so hey but when, we, when i first met you it was 2010 and uh, we were both sponsored by ranger up which a company we've been involved with for a long time and we were fighting in strike force and then really cool we had an after fight party together i remember being so excited because i was already a fan of you before we were friends and then i and then i fought in the same car with you and had this after fight party it was supposed to be epic and then it was kind of bittersweet because I won my fight, and you lost the fight that I thought you won uh, to Jacare. <laughs> and we, so that was when we first we first met. And uh, yeah, that was that was a rough night. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was trying to be happy and celebrate, but you know, we had uh, Toby Nunn there crying because it was your match. <laughs> Toby's always crying, man. He's I'm always crying. crying. That guy. Man, I've been on hunt with him, and he starts crying. I was like, problem. "Why are you crying?" <laughs> Toby's crying. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But a lot's changed in your, your life since uh, 2010. You've, uh, you've really amassed uh, a, a lot of uh, popularity and status. And, you know, people love all the stuff that you do. And, and, uh, but, and I think there's probably a million probably podcasts out there that would really talk about, like, your big fights and, and uh, a lot of different things in your life, like hunt, hunting, hunting Hitler and, and hard to kill. But I want to go a little bit further back and, and really talk about, like, how you became, you know, Tim Kennedy. What's I know your dad, Mike, uh, you come from an amazing family. Your dad's an amazing hero to this country. And just really what shaped your life into coming, how you grew up, what brought you to join the military, special forces, and, and really what shaped you as a child. Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I, I find it funny now where like celebrity or I, I was just hanging out with the family. Um, I just got back from a deployment overseas and um, got to spend the weekend with my family for the first time in a minute. And we're going around and, you know, people come up and say, hey, Tim, I can't get And they're like shaking. They want to take photos of me. And, you know, you, you see you've been amassing this popularity of late. I haven't done anything different ever. I'm too old. I'm too hairy. I'm too scarred. I'm too dumb to change. So I just keep doing the same things. And now I just, I, I find it ironic that we are moving circularly back to a beginning where people are appreciating hard work, resilience, a relentless attitude. Um, that being damaged and broken doesn't mean that you're a failure. You know, it just means that you've lived a lot of life. Um, and that's, uh, I, I think that's kind of where our origin starts and mine does is, uh, is my home with a bunch of pretty incredible people and role models to look up to. Yeah. What were some of those influences? You come to a place now where, you know, it is about not being a victim, not uh, allowing people to call you a victim, personal responsibility and those things. Uh, what we learn often is that some of the things that damage us happen in youth, but also some of the principles that build a character in us that allows us to perform as adults also begins in youth. Uh, what were some of those things in your early years, you know, before the military, before all these things that people know about that helped to shape you along that, that route? Maybe even if it wasn't, you know, perfect and get you there, but it started, started you along that path. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to join your guys' club and be writing a book this year. And um, kind of what we're talking about right now is you're going to have two different storylines, these two arcs. The first arc is me being an absolute moron, time and time again, <laughs> failing, um, getting crushed, losing, getting blown up. Um, like I, I, the, 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 the dumb things that I did throughout my life, a period of time where I thought I had AIDS, I had a couple of women pregnant, neither of them were the woman that I was living with. Um, 
And that is one storyline, one arc of all of these things that ultimately should have broken a normal person, Hmm. but tied to the current timeline of what I am doing now and the things that I did in my military career and the things that I did in my fighting career, fighting for world titles, going overseas multiple times, earning medals, medals for valor. Those things are directly tied to the times that I'm, I'm taking off my clothes in Morrow Bay, California, and I'm walking next to the right side of the rock, just on the north side. And I'm going to swim out to the fog because I don't know what else I'm going to do. Um, cause everything else in my life has gone wrong. Crash my motorcycle. My, one of my heroes, my grandpa just died. Um, I think I have AIDS. Um, I just lost my professional debut. There's two women that are pregnant in my life and they're both telling me I'm the father. Um, you know, like that is, and yeah. I'm going to go for a swim into the fog, mm-hmm. you know, and then, uh, fast forward 10 years and I'm, and I'm, and I'm running into the fog, the brown out of a helicopter, uh, towards the sound of gunfire you know it's um like i can't give you enough examples of the times that i failed as a youth uh, so we'll, we'll talk about my my heroes uh first and foremost is my dad and my brother yeah, yeah. um they're both just amazing i love you guys <laughs> let me drink out my pink straw again <laughs> thank you so proud <sighs> yeah Mike, Man, my, mike's incredible he is so I grew up with a dad that was a narcotics officer. He was part of these pretty incredible task forces during the the peak of the war on drugs. Mm-hmm. If you think back to the war on terrorism that you know that that we were part of, um, like those were some pretty good years. You know, where you're in Iraq in 05, 06, wild wild west. You know, you're in you're in Afghanistan, 07, 08. Yeah, pretty, pretty good times, you know, like a lot of things you could get away with. Well, that, that was my dad's era of the war on drugs, hmm. where he's flying to these Caribbean places to steal planes of cocaine from Pablo Escobar and fly them to the United States, where he's asking his 10 and 12 year old sons, respectively, my older brother and myself, to sneak into a garage. He's like, hey, there's a yellow Camaro in there. I need the license plate. And if it's unlocked, see if you can get some stuff out of the glove box. You know, like <laughs> that was what he was asking. <laughs> my um, and that was normal in my life where we'd go to the Oregon river and we would just drive from campsite to campsite. My, my mom would drive, but me, my brother, my dad, and my eight year old sister would float down the white water rapids by float. I mean, we didn't have inner tubes. We just swam it. And that was normal because I had a water polo Olympic level athlete of a father and then a freak athlete of an older brother and then an insane little sister. Um, this was just normal, you know, and pushing off the ground and getting like a, a rock shoved halfway th- through your foot. You get to the next campsite and your dad's like, well, I forgot the tweezers. So we're going to use the, pl- the pliers, boy. You know, you're like, this is awesome. You know, it made everything in life seem so easy. Yeah. And it is. Life's easy. Yeah. We uh we talk a lot about decision. Um, you know, one of the great in my opinion, one of the great books ever written was Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Uh he was in a concentration camp as a psychiatrist and kind of evaluated what was happening there. And he concluded after watching all of this for a few years that the one thing you can't take away from a person is their ability to decide. They get to decide what they're gonna do with their life. They get to decide if they're gonna move forward or stay where they are. They get to make a decision. And I think the difference often between someone who performs after thinking they have AIDS and getting women pregnant that they're you know, not in a relationship with and all the other brokenness that we uh, might talk about is a decision. I'm not going to let that define me. I'm going to decide to do something important. What were those decision points in your life? Maybe some, some times where you said, I had to decide that I was going to move forward instead of fall back. Yeah. Um... There's so many. Like, right, right before or we, we started filming this, um, this kid, one of my friends, puts me on the phone with a kid that just failed buds. And, you know, he's like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I was like, what, what do you mean you don't know what you're going to do? You're going to get up and you're going to keep going. He's like, yeah. well, I'm, I'm, I'm a broken failure. I'm like, what? So <laughs> I told him a story about me on a run this morning. And I'm pushing my four-year-old, who is about the size of Chad? <laughs> that's not that's not saying a lot it's a really four-year-old. Four-year-old. <laughs> and we're in a little bop stroller and i got my two dogs and we're going up a hill and i get like four fists away up this hill and i'm like 
ooh, this is a big hill. It feels like I'm doing a sled push with a 90 pound sack of blood <laughs> in the Bob Schuller, which is my four year old son. And I get, and I, and I have to walk the last fifth of the hill. And I tell this kid, I was like, do you want, I just failed a run this morning. Imagine that. I have my son sitting there looking at me and I can't even make it up a hill. So does that mean I'm broken? Does that mean I'm a failure? Does that give me an opportunity to come back tomorrow and do that same hill and be a little bit faster, be a little bit stronger, and a little bit, a little bit harder to kill? And that's what all of those instances of my life have been where when that Coast Guard boat rolled up to me in Morro Bay, California, and that captain looked down at me and he says, hey, boy, that, that water looks pretty cold. I'm like, oh, that's not a nice thing to say to a naked dude swimming in cold water. Um, but yeah, man, I'm pretty cold. And I don't know which way the shore is because I had swam so far out of that fog. Um, you know, and he gives me a choice. He gives me an option. He gives me a deciding point of, hey, do you want to come up here? Um, or you want to figure this out? And I was like, if I get up there, can I have a blanket to cover up what's going on right now? And uh, so he gave me a blanket. But whether it's like ranger school where I'm in an ambush line and it's in the middle of winter, it's December. We're about to start an ambush. I'm freezing. I'm shaking. And my, my tiny little frozen peckers is like vibrating off that frozen ground. I'm behind a 240, waiting for those two, for the Humvees to roll by so we can do this ambush. And the dude next to me just stands up and he walks down to the road. He's like, Rangers, I'm done. I quit. And they're like, well, cool. Head, head, uh, head back up the road a little bit. And you got some hot coffee. And I was like, Hot coffee? Did you just say hot coffee? He said hot coffee. How do I quit? How do I get out of this thing? And then the ambush starts. You know, like it was almost that the decision point was taken from me, but I was either a little bit too dumb or a little bit too tough to know how to quit. And that, you know, went on to become the honor graduate of Ranger School to um, go back to my special forces unit and go to an even more elite team. Um, and you know, sometimes you you got to make a bunch of tiny little decisions that put you in a position to not fail, right. where that decision point's almost made for you. And that's what I keep doing is, man, I just keep trying to do the right thing 99% of the time. Sometimes I've made mistakes, clearly. But sometimes I'm just like, I don't have any other option besides to jump out of this aircraft or to pull that trigger because that's the right thing to do because I've done everything right so far. Yeah. You just keep moving forward one step at a time. And you, right. you see, you see that in, in combat, right, and in, in life, and in court, these tough courses. And as a fighter, I, I know, if, you know, I don't have to have been in your shoes to know that. That's probably been a moment in the, in the fight where you sit on that bench between rounds, and you're like, I don't know, if, I don't know if I want to go back out for this sec. But you just something about that you're not going to stay on that bench. You're not going to pull a Yawa Romero and stay an extra. <laughs> you're going to get back out there and do it again. But it's yeah. it's, it's 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 something you have to overcome, right? Yeah, there, there's there's two. I mean, your Romero is a great example of that. You know, like I was infamous through my whole entire fight career. You did not want to go into deep water with me because the second, third round, fourth round, fifth round, I'm gonna come out there just as mean as I was the first round and the second round. The your your Romero fight was a unique one because um, I beat him up the second round. I came out there even meaner than I did the first round. But then at the end of the second round, when I thought I had won, I thought you just pointed out he quit. <laughs> He quit, but more importantly, I quit. Yeah. I had left the arena. I was already celebrating my victory. So then when I went back out there, I was like, oh, what is going on? Oh, wait, I got to go. It's because I, I missed an opportunity, a decision point to make the right decision, which was sit there on that bench, look across that cage at that coward that is trying to cheat mm. and know that I'm going to go back out there with the same tenacity that I have for the last 10 minutes. Right. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, people look at that moment in my career and there's like, that would have put you in the that would have put you in a fight against Michael Bisbing to beat him again to become the middleweight champion. For sure. Cool. I don't care. You know, I, I, I failed in that moment, but it gave me an opportunity to grow, to become a, uh, hopefully an even better person than the other areas of my life. Incredible life lesson. Yeah. Yeah. What, uh, what <laughs> is that said? I sure would have liked to that fight. <laughs> uh, we all know he quit. Yeah, <laughs> we see it. So, uh, I, this is something that I know you're passionate about and we are as well. And uh, I know Chad wanted to elaborate on this a little bit, but um, the idea of victimhood amongst veterans. Uh, we served and I, uh, you know, my story, I left the Marine Corps and didn't look back for 10 years. 10 years later, I realized a lot of the guys that I had served with were, were hurting pretty bad. Some had taken their lives, some had been killed in combat, some were just struggling and understood I had a responsibility to go back and you know, kind of bring those guys forward and, and do what I could to, to help in that way. Uh, but what 
I've realized along the way, and Chad and I have talked about this a lot, we see this often, and I, I know that you have as well, is this, this victimization of veterans. And sometimes it's because the world, our culture, our society creates victims out of veterans. But a lot of times it's because veterans wear this mantle of, of victimhood. And they've decided that what they did somewhere else was awesome. <laughs> but, but now they're a victim. Now people owe them. And that's, that's kind of the opposite of what you're talking about, right? No one owes you anything. And if anything, there's a responsibility that goes along with having served your country. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we just put an exclamation mark after like, no, that nobody owes you anything. Nobody owes you like, anything. Like, no, 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 definitely not the army. Cause the army is going to always do one thing. The military is going to always do one thing. They're going to take that's they're, they're, they're going to, they're going to create something and they're going to try to use it to the end. Um, and when you rose, when you raised your hand and you swore protect the constitution foreign domestic, when you said, this is, I volunteered to do this job, whether it's an airborne ranger, a Marine scout sniper, or a green beret, um, they didn't promise you a lot. I mean, they didn't even promise you food and they definitely didn't promise you a place to sleep. Right. So, I mean, if anything, they, they told you, you weren't going to get those. Right. Things, <laughs> right. You know, right. they didn't promise success. They didn't, they didn't promise valor. They didn't promise courage. They caught, they promised pain. They promised suffering. They promised, they promised failure. They knew that you're going to fail at mm -hmm. times. And so I don't know where the origin of this victim entitlement came yep. from for the military. And it is, it is a disease and it has spread <laughs> rampant. And uh, we, we have to nip it in the bud. You know, I, I own veteran companies and we just had this conversation where it was like, somebody said, well, shouldn't they be doing business with us because we're veterans? And I like, if I had a desk to flip out, <laughs> I'd look at things like, it's so crazy. I was like, no, they're going to do business with us because we are the best because we're the brightest because we because we give them the best product, because we work harder, we have the best customer service, because we're the smartest, because we're going to be the first people there and the last to leave. That's why they're going to come to us. Yeah. And that's what makes us special, is our ability to not be entitled, to yes. our, our ability to not be victims. It's our choice every single day to be the fastest, the strongest, the meanest, the most tenacious person out there in every single realm. And that is what makes us unique. Nobody owes us anything. And... When I, when I see that dude with the, with, you know, like the, I served here with a beard and, and maybe a scar somewhere or maybe a missing leg and you know, like, you can see the brokenness right. and um, you're not going to get a second of sympathy from me. You're, what you're going to get is an expectation of excellence from anybody that has ever served. And I will accept nothing besides extraordinary from yeah. everybody that has ever worn the uniform. How did we lose that? That used to be the, that used to be think, understood. How do we lose it? I think one of the things that when you talk about what the military owes you or gives you, what, they, what the military does gives you is the, the opportunity, the opportunity to serve. And, uh, and, and when we relinquish that to somehow think we're entitled to something beyond that service, I think we give up that, that pride, that sense of pride, that sense of accomplishment that comes with the opportunity to serve. You kind of trade it. And uh, we see this a lot, Tim, at, at Mighty Oaks because People would see Mighty Oaks as a foundation, our mission, and what we do. We're obviously very passionate about, about the hardships and helping people overcome those things. So people would confuse that with, we, we love these guys. We care for them. They're victims. we got to help these poor veterans get. Yeah. And that's absolutely 100%, 180 degrees opposite of who you are. When right. they come to our program, you know, on a peer-to-peer -peer level, we challenge them and we tell them, hey, this victim thing, you're better than this. It's time to get back up and get in the fight. And it, it shocks a lot of guys because they've been exposed to so many other people in this country who love them and mean well, but have coddled them and we call them hug a vet programs. And, uh, and, and uh, what, do we, what do we do? We're not yeah, the we, hug a vet, we're, we're the poke a vet in the chest. That's what we yeah. do. <laughs> sometimes beyond, sometimes beyond that. We, uh, yeah. And so it, it's, it's kind of been in the beginning. It was very shocking to me because what their expectation was when they came to mighty Oaks uh, was totally different and they were kind of caught off guard by it or, or still yeah. are. But why do we relinquish yeah. that? I mean, that's the question I, I can't get my head around is why do guys, men and women who go into the military to do great things, to do something that's bigger than them, why do they relinquish that? I mean, what is it that's lost where you set your side, your pride aside and you just say, I, I'm a victim now. You need to give things to me. Yes, it's, it's a really weird thing about human nature. You know, um, a really wise man said that, you know, once, once you can, once somebody can get something from free by voting for it, mm. you, they, they never need to work again. Sure. And it's, it's kind of the same with any form of entitlement where yeah. 
when somebody has to struggle and somebody has pain and suffering through everything to find success, and then they learn that they can get something for free, that they can be broken, they can be victims, and, and that there might be an, easy, an easier solution right. um, to get to be comfortable, they forget what it means to be, I don't want to use the word savage, um, I'll say successful. Right. They forget yes. what it takes to accomplish. Right. And I, I don't have a single thing in my whole entire life that came easy. There's not, there's not a gun in my safe that I, that I look at and I'd be like, man, I got that one for free. I like that one. And right. then I look at the other one that I, I had to, like, um, a lot of pain you know, <laughs> yeah. to get that gun and, and, and the, the memories behind it, knowing what I can do with it. Mm. And that goes for everything in my whole entire life, you know, from, from my kids to my businesses. There's nothing that has been given to me. And I was like, oh yeah, I value that. Yeah. And that is the disconnect that we're talking about where, um, and that, that's where I think it's been lost is they forgot what it meant to do real work. They forgot what, how satisfying, how much more satisfying something is once you earn it. Right. Right. How do we, uh, how do we get back to that? How do we get back to understanding that as a community? Uh, culturally, I, I think we have to have a cultural shift of appreciating the process. You know, like I am so, I'm, I'm almost scared. You know, you, you want to find um, like, what is Tim Kennedy scared of? Yeah. It's losing, not even losing, forgetting what it feels like to be a savage. Yeah. You know, like, wh why are you still deploying, Tim? Why do you, why do you go on these hunts where you, you drive up to Montana with a backpack, a bow and a gun to, to walk through the wilderness for three weeks to maybe find an elk? Do you know what? So I can feel pain. That's why. And so I can be a savage. And so I cannot forget what it means to be a badass. Mm -hmm. So I want to go on these deployments, not because I'm not contributing to democracy and to capitalism and to the American way of life and giving people an opportunity, you know, buy with through all that stuff, whatever. It's yeah. also to remember what it feels like to serve. Yeah. 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 The service part of it is something that uh, is lost. I think as a veteran community though, uh, we've almost incentive incentivized people to, um, to walk away from that. To quit. <laughs> to quit. To yeah. quit. Yeah, to quit. <laughs> I totally agree with you. I'm just trying to find the specific people that are incentivizing failure where it's like, okay, you know, uh, all yeah. right, now here's something free. You, you right. give me a name, you give me a name. I'm going to try. What's crazy though is I, I think we, we've yeah. moved from the Vietnam era treatment of veterans to now the veteran in America is a sacred cow, right? So if you haven't served, you have no right to say anything to a veteran. You have no right to point anything out that's bad uh, with the veteran, whether it's the way they behave or whatever. And so the culture has said, we're not touching it. So as a community, we need to police it. I think when we build memorials to people who have taken their lives, we're incentivizing failure. I think when we, when we treat uh, those who have struggled and are broken and we treat them as a special class of warrior, then we've incentivized failure. I, I don't think it's a person. I think it's an ideal that we need to get away from. It's, we're, we're, we're all preaching the same thing. It's a cultural dynamic shift about how we're looking at what success is. Right. And failure is not success. There's th th those things are the opposite ends of the dictionary. Yeah. And yeah. if you have struggles, if you, if you're struggling with depression, if you're struggling with post-traumatic stress, um, addiction, I got it, man. That does yeah. not mean that you're broken. That does not right. mean that you're failure. That doesn't That's mean right. that we can't give you a helping hand. But I'm not going to celebrate that's right. the fact that, that you're having a struggle. What I'm going to celebrate is you overcoming that. That's right. You know, and that's where the culture of success has to be a resounding bell of, you no, know, we are strong, yeah. we are tenacious, and we are not going to give in to this thing. That's right. Yeah. And that's one of the things that at Mighty Oaks we really right. focus on. It's really the, the ena enabling, not enabling, but actually empowering. And we, we, we have a very – strategic process uh, methodology of bringing guys to really just a point to realize that, that the incidents that they passed as bad as they may be, uh, whatever they face in their childhood, in their life, in Iraq, Afghanistan, wherever, those things may be bad. And it may be in some cases heroic or, or tragic, but those things don't lead us to the darkest moments of our life. What does is the choices we make in response to those things. We never lose the ability to decide, like Jeremy said, to choose. And, and when we can corner people into accepting that responsibility, and stop blaming everyone else for what happened to them. 
then they can make the choice to actually move forward. And then we can come around them and truly uh, not enable them, but empower them and encourage them and support them to move forward. Like, a- anybody could have an excuse for, and I, I mean excuse, and I'm sure I'm going to get hate about this, an excuse for being depressed or an excuse for having post-traumatic stress. Look at Chad and I. Like, I don't know how many times I've had bad, I've been too close to a breach point, how many bad jumps I've had where I'm hanging in the trees or I've hit too hard, where the wind gusted right when I'm 20 feet above the air and I slam into the ground. How many times I've been hit in the head with an overhand right? How many times in sparring? You want to talk about traumatic brain injury and CTE, TBI? Like the two dudes on, on this screen yeah. right now, almost <laughs> have the most unique amount of traumatic brain damage than anybody in this whole entire field. I've been blown up numerous times where yeah. people in the vehicle in front of me and behind me died, but I'm still here and I'm still healthy, not depressed. And there's a lot of decisions and opportunities where, yeah, I could pick up a, pick up a bottle. Or I could pick up my gi and I could go and train. Yeah. You know, I could have picked up a bottle of pills or I could have picked up the phone and called a friend and gone hunting. You yeah. know, I could have picked up um, a glass and chucked against the wall when I was in a fight with, with my wife or I could have picked up the Bible and read a second. You know, there's a lot of different ways that we can fail and there's a lot of different decision points where we can overcome. And we got to celebrate the ones and, and the process, the painful process of getting stronger. Yeah. And honestly, look at the failures and be like, what went wrong and how do we fix the next one? Yeah, Not right. celebrate them, but fix it. Yeah. One of the uh, great success stories, I think, at Mighty Oaks, and I'm sure Chad would agree, and, and Tim, you know him, this is why I bring him up, is Chris Biggs. Uh, Chris is a guy <laughs> who was in the Army, uh, lost his leg due to his service, and for years has struggled with uh, a lot of different things and is now making strides to move past so much of that to become a successful uh, contributor to society. And he's making these steps and that's what his community around him, that small community is celebrating. And and really that's what we need to be looking at. And that's what we need to be focusing on. Yeah, and not an easy journey for him. It, it's been, yeah. Yeah, it's been <laughs> an overwhelming journey. For anybody. It's not supposed to be an easy journey. <laughs> yeah. right. You know, if you want yeah. an easy journey, go be, I don't know, an architect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and for all the architects watching, we're not saying it's easy what you do. No, I can't. Just a little bit. Maybe you click some buttons in a computer. I mean, yeah, how hard can it be? Yeah. yeah another lot, please. <laughs> there's, there's nobody there. There's a wolf behind you. Is it, it, what is that behind you? Is it a dog or? Oh, yeah. This, this little dog? <laughs> yeah. That, that guy? He's a dire wolf. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, so, yeah. so what uh, what is it that uh, let's talk about two things one I'd like to know okay as a parent what you're going to teach your kids and two and maybe the first one is uh, how important are the other people in your life to pick you up when you fall down to help you keep moving forward and to, to overcome um, well my, my kids know what hard work is <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, they uh, you know, even a three-year-old right now knows that he's going to be exercising every day. And, uh, you know, we're, we're practicing our letters and we're learning how to read and mm. we're memorizing our words. Like that's a three-year-old, yeah. you know, my, my teenagers are, you know, at 16, um, decision points, right. What colleges are we going to, right. what jobs are we going to have that are setting us up for what careers we're going down? Um, so it's like, it's showing them that it's lots of these millions of tiny little decisions, It's not going to be one. There's not going to be a point where you're going to be like, oh, I'm going to be successful. It's going to be just countless millions upon millions, if not billions of tiny decisions that are ultimately setting you up for success. And that's what I try to drive home is like, you have to make every single one of them right. You know, every single time that you get up to go to school, whether you're having a test, a quiz, um, a reading, every one of those days is going to contribute cumulatively to the end, that grade, that GPA and that SAT. Those are going to tell you what schools you can get in. Right. And of those schools, you're going to get it. So it just goes on and on and on from a three-year-old to a 16-year-old. Um, you know, and the people I surround myself with, uh, I think that has more to do with my success than anything. Um, so I just got inducted into the Sports Hall of Fame by Arnold Schwarzenegger um, at this last Arnold Classic. And right, I was, I was actually typing kind of the, my thank induction speech. And the thing that was the clearest about this, I don't know, this thing that I'm writing um, is all of the people around me. Right. You know, pe- people like Chad and people like Mike Glover and people like Nick Palmashano. Um, 
you know, Shane Steiner, like my, my close kind of friends, the people that I, I consider people that influence me, um, they are extraordinary. Like they are just amazing people. Right. They're not perfect. You know, Chad Short, um, <laughs> kind of trollishy. Yeah. Um, Get chimpanzee. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Nick is, is sometimes built kind of uh, like a bowling ball. Um, Shane is faster and stronger and smarter than me in, in pretty much everything. But they they don't, you know, Nick and Shane, they, they, they don't let me get away with anything ever. My dad, my brother, um, they are honest with me first and foremost about everything. And um, like, I don't want anybody that would pander to my ego. I don't want anybody that would for a second, give me an untruthful answer because that's what they think I want to hear. Right. Um, and anybody that would do that isn't a friend. Mm -hmm. And what has been really painfully clear in the past year is the people that I thought were friends, the people that were telling me the things I wanted to hear. Um, ultimately, they were ones that were trying to steal from me sure. or they were ones that were going to stab me in the back or use me as, as, um, a jumping off point for something they wanted. Yep. You know, it, it, it was really just the ones that were sometimes jerks. Yeah. Uh, the ones <laughs> that said really painful things to yeah. me. The ones where I was like, what? You're not going to talk to me like that. I was like, oh, but you are because you're a real friend. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. My tribe is now a pretty t tight knit, powerful yeah. tribe. Yeah. It's so <laughs> funny you say that because, uh, I mean, I, I think back as you're talking, I think back of the lowest moment in my life was it, you know, Afghanistan or at the moment of a tra traumatic situation or, or a crisis in my life? The lowest point in my life was when I realized that I had surrounded myself with people that told me everything I wanted to hear and not what, yeah. not what I needed to hear. I had systematically pushed all accountability out, out of my life. And that's, that was the absolute rock bottom point in my life. And there's just so much, so much truth and so much power in what you just said, because unless we could allow those people in our life that could tell us those difficult things that could challenge us and call us out. When we need to be called out. We're never going to have that accountability that we need to be able to move forward in life. Yeah. We kind of have this idea that it's a lone ranger kind of thing. Like I, I'm the one that needs to do it, but real men are not men who walk alone. They're men who have friends around them who really help them keep moving forward. Yeah. I mean, like, I don't, I don't, I'm thank, thank God. Um, I don't know right now if, I could do something wrong without three or four people being at my house in a matter of minutes. Like, let's say um, I'm at the gym training and, and the places that I tra train at are really popular and lots of people come through the doors and there's tons of beautiful women. Let's just say I went up and I talked to one of those beautiful girls flirt flirt flirtatiously. Man, I bet it would take about a na nanosecond for my three friends to be yeah. pulling me by my ear and scuffing me up in the bathroom. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, like, I haven't had a drink of, of hard liquor in, 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 a, in, a, in a few years. Not right. because there's anything wrong with it. And I, I respect people that appreciate, you know, a fine American bourbon. That's totally fine. Um, I know that I've made a bunch of bad decisions when I've been drunk. And right. I've um, and I've been looking at what's been happening in the special operations community, where guys have been doing dumb things while they've been drinking, from a green beret getting strangled by a couple of Navy SEALs to to a green beret trying to smuggle in ninety pounds of coke, um, and being like, you know what? I'm just not going to do it. If I'm traveling, I'm just not going to touch it. Yeah. And not, not that I've ever had a problem with it, just because I just think it's better not to. Yeah. But I bet if I picked up a bottle and I poured a shot. Even if I was trying to be sneaky in the closet, it would take a matter of minutes before <laughs> Shane or Nick were at my door being like, what's going on right now? <laughs> you okay? You okay? Yeah. You know? yeah. That's good, man. It's a good place to be. It's a really good yeah. place to be. That's awesome. Do you think one of those bad decisions that you made was the whole army thing, or is that not something you can care about? <laughs> yeah, man, me coming to the army was I was just curious. <laughs> Um, I looked at the Marines, um, but uh, I didn't want to do it. Yeah. No, I um, I like I like using crowns to write things. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. okay to be a, it's okay to be afraid. I know you have this big persona and stuff, but it's all right. We all have our limit. All I, our limit. I, 
I, uh, <laughs> I do. Can I tell a Marine story? Please. Go ahead. All right. <laughs> so in 2006, I was part of a task force that was in Iraq trying to kill Zarqawi. He was a really, really bad dude. And, um, and we went on a half mission, a helicopter assault force. And we had a couple follow on targets and we we're getting near the sunrise. And uh, 160th didn't want to come pick us up. The, the special operations aviation wing yeah. was like, hey, we, we got shot up when we came to land. And then when we came to provide you some air cover, we got shot up again. Two of our birds are down and sunrise is coming. So uh, we can't come get you. And we're so, like, sorry. <laughs> so that sucks. <laughs> so, you know, we get up and, and uh, we figure out that the closest friendly anything is this tiny little fob that's being run by a, a, this rifleman company and the scariest moment I've ever had in all of my deployments, I mean, even more so than being blown up and being in a three day gunfight, losing some friends was walking up to a Marine base at four o'clock in the morning <laughs> and hearing a private's voice ring out, stop or I'm going to shoot you. <laughs> um, well, they fought, they, they let us in grace, graciously. And, um, you know, we, I fell asleep on, on, I don't even know what this device was. Um, it was a Marine something. Um, it was, I, I think it was a T ration. Um, Probably case. was. I woke up with this, with this kid's poncho liner all over me and a rucksack underneath my head. And, um, you know, we, we had been in a couple of gunfights that night. We had three or four fall on targets. We'd been walking through the Iraq desert for, you know, four hours after our last target to get yeah. to this base. And um, these kids had nothing like they, they had been eating tea rations and they'd been blowing up every single day that they'd been in this thing. And, you know, we're, we're a, ta a special operations task force, um, a specialized unit within special forces. And, you know, like we have protein powder, we have weights, we have Olymp Olympic weight lifting equipment, you know, we have like pallets of porn and these guys had jugs of water that they were using to do their, that they had filled with sand or cement um that yeah. they're using to do their yeah. exercises right and um and i asked their commander i was like hey can um can we bring you guys some stuff for letting us stay here and he looks me right in the face he says no that's like well, i mean I'm, I'm talking like protein powder maybe some weights <laughs> right. you know right. some some tvs you know he's like i don't want anything right right now every single one of these marines in here is is ready to to go to war and we're at war every single day and they need to remember they're at war and i was just like Day, you guys, are <laughs> yeah. but he was right. Like they had everything that they needed to sure. do their jobs, and they didn't need anything else. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I argue, and I would argue that they might have been more elite than this extra elite special operations unit on a special operations task force trying to find this number one bad guy in all of Iraq. <laughs> um, and they were just a bunch of, you know, infantry riflemen. Yep. in the middle of the desert yeah it's amazing that's awesome yeah. what a great story yeah, yeah it's funny i don't know if as i told you tim but my son hunter is uh he's deploying right now he's uh he's a uh, with third anglico and he's uh assigned to the georgians and he's going in a, a little four-man marine uh thick team and so they're in germany doing their last i think today or tomorrow is their last training uh, day of their training ex final training exercise before they move over to afghanistan and he's telling me these same things that, like they're uh Pretty much, their the commander has cut off, cut them off from everything and try to transition them to deployment lifestyle. And uh, so he was trying to call in and whining to me, <laughs> and I was kind of explaining the same, you know, same process. It's like they, you know, you have to be mentally like just dialed in to be, you know, to transition from the comforts of life into being in, in deployed and being stuck on a fob for the next eight months because that's yeah. what life's going to be. It's pretty, it's pretty neat. It, well, not neat, I tell you. It's it's been. I'm very proud, but it's also been a kind of a struggle for me. And I haven't been to Afghanistan yeah. many times and seen what goes on there, to, you know, for my son to go. But, uh, but yeah. I'm definitely very proud of him. So. Yeah, uh, I um, I couldn't. I honestly, I couldn't imagine. Uh, I, I wouldn't wish what I've seen or done on my worst enemy. Yeah, you know. Um, so I, I couldn't imagine getting watching my son go over to be. 
Thank God I got uh, 15 years to figure that out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> to make him an architect. <laughs> there you go, yeah. My kids are yeah. going to be the greatest architects and accountants in the world. <laughs> You'd be the best button clickers. Yeah, I, I tell you, if I wasn't in the place I'm in in my life right now, if I didn't have uh, the people that you're talking, the people around me that I have around me right now, I, I don't know if I'd be able to endure uh, him going. But a, a couple of things have really prepared me. One is uh, is having that accountability group, having a great support group around me, people I can lean on uh, when I do have hard times thinking about it being deployed. But, but also uh, the lessons I've learned in my life, not just applying them to make myself better, but using those lessons to invest in my son and make him better and prepare him. Because uh, I tell you, I don't know, and Jeremy knows uh, Hunter really well. I don't know a more uh, just joyful like confident young man than Hunter. He's, right. he, he, he loves his job. He's, you know, he's a Florida air controller. He believes in his job. Uh, but outside of being, you know, technically skilled to do his job, I mean, he is like, when it comes to spirituality, he's spiritually strong. He's physically tough. He's mentally tough. And th- those have come from, you know, just fatherhood lessons passing on from uh, not my successes, but some of my failures in investing in him. And, and that gives me a good sense of peace and confidence of launching him out there. Hey, Tim, talk about some of the uh, the initiatives that you're involved in right now. You have Sheepdog Response, and I know there's a bunch of stuff that you're involved in, but uh, talk about some of those things and how you're supporting a lot of first responders, uh, a lot of our military, and some of the other things that you're doing. Yeah, um, so, you know, a Green Beret is first and foremost a force multiplier. Right. You know, like We think we're the best door kicker shooters on the planet, you know, free fall, combat dive, hoorah. Um but you know what what we're supposed to be is ambassadors warrior ambassadors that can go into a country and train an indigenous force to stand up for themselves right um and it's been real painful to you know be 15 years in special operations and to see the things that i saw in iraq in 0506 start happening here at home and how ill prepared we were as a nation, both as a society yeah. and as um, and as a law enforcement first responder EMS. Yep. Um, you know, to see a bombing happen in Iraq and be like, and see how an Iraqi is more prepared for that than we are. That right. that made me that broke my heart. Yeah. So sheepdog response was my 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 answer to that was taking all the tools that we learned overseas about crisis management active shooter um and taking those skills keeping the blood in the good guys letting the blood out of the bad guys and starting to teach absolutely positively every single yeah. person i could teach like yeah. i don't care who you are i don't care what your job is you know i don't care if you're an accountant or an architect <laughs> you need to come to my course yeah, absolutely. Because you're going to be at the boston marathon yep. because you're going to be a nightclub dancing and somebody's going to walk in and not like the people that dance there. You're going to be at a Christmas party and they're going to come in and start shooting you. You're going to be, you know, at a mosque or a church or a whatever. Yep. And we as a society, we just, we just got to grow up. We have been so blessed from 1945 to about 1998, where we had a really good spell of just a few bad things happening. Yeah. You know, and then things started happening. Right. And, uh, and, you know, it's a, a really trag- tragic circular event where, you know, weak men make bad times and, you know, bad times make hard men and then hard, can- hard yeah, men yeah, make yeah. good times. Yeah. And good times make weak men and weak men make hard times. Hmm. Well, we, we had really good times for like 70 years and now we've had some hard times and, um, and, and we are now getting hard men again, I hope. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I'm trying to get this idea of being not toxic masculinity, because that's not what this is. This right. is an empowerment of somebody that can protect and provide the preservation yeah. of human life. Are you seeing more of an interest in that? It seems like there is more of a, a concern and interest in, uh, in learning. It's crazy, yeah. Um, I wish I had 70 more instructors. You know, yeah. we, we're running one or two cl- courses a month and they're sold out. You know, like we have a course in two weeks here in Austin and we doubled down where we had two courses in one week and both of them, you know, like they're sold out and I, I'm yeah. trying to get extra instructors. Yeah, yeah. 
good problems for a business, but it's bad problems when you're trying to get a message out. And you know, while it is business, it's more importantly an, an, an idea of being ready to protect. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, what are some of the other uh, veterans initiatives that you're involved with? Some, maybe some, some groups that you support, some things that you're involved in. I know there's a bunch of stuff you do that no one hears about, which, uh, which I think is funny because you have a big personality and everybody knows about your stuff. But there's also a bunch of stuff nobody knows about that you're involved in. Yeah, the um, can you guys still hear me? Yep. Yeah, got you. Yeah. Ranger Up is a is an apparel company I've been with for a long time. Um, we just launched a a a news network called the Bad News Network. <laughs> and it's it's a little satire. Yeah. But I, I, it's been so frustrating to see the polarization in American society where nobody just has a, an honest perspective on what is happening in yeah, the United right. States. Like everybody has an agenda, whether yeah. it's CNN, NBC, Fox, you know, everybody, and I, they're not even denying it anymore. Right. So That's right. That news network is us just talking about the news in like the most calloused, not heartless, <laughs> because we really care about the things we're talking about, but like, hey, here's what happened and this is what it means. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like, Ranger Up is something I'm real proud of because of all the other things that we do. You know, we've, we've helped, helped a lot of different people from Mighty Oaks to Team Rubicon to the Gallant Few. You know, we, we were vigilant supporters of lots of different nonprofits and, and veteran organizations. Um, Wooby Shoes is another one of my, my business ventures. Um, you know, we just make shoes made by special operations guys, but we're an all veteran owned company. Yeah. Um, you know, the, uh, I just think the, most important thing that I'm trying to do right now is positively affect people to, to get out and do and not to be scared and not to be victims, not to be entitled to, to just do, you know, I got new TV shows coming out in the middle of writing a book, but none of that stuff matters because the things that I'm passionate about are, you know, making, making us as a culture and a society uh, meet our potential. Yeah, that's right. That's awesome, man. In, in this, uh, in the sheepdog response training, um, just from what do you incorporate, you know, the personal responsibility and scenario based? Like, I, I'm just kind of curious about how that applies. Like, when we work with, when we talked about earlier, per, assuming personal responsibility and, and tactics and survival and uh, crisis scenarios, what's the aspect of personal responsibility in this? Yeah. So, I think the, the most we, we have. <laughs> It's kind of sad, but we have attrition. So people pay to come to these courses, right? And they don't come the second day or the third day. Um, and it's because we make it – like this is not one of those, hey, that was a great shoot, dude. That was really fantastic work. Man, you ran super fast. Like those are not the things that happen here. What we do is we show them what they should be doing, and everything else is pain. Remember in SEER school? Like they don't tell you they, – they ask you a question, and then they hit you. <laughs> and they hit you because you did something wrong. Um, there's no explanation about why they hit you, but they know that you did something wrong. You may or may not know if you did something wrong, but you ultimately got hit. Uh, <laughs> that is kind of the process of sheepdog response, where there's pain, there's struggle. And what we make it so obvious and evident is that we're, you're not going to get good at the things that we're trying to show you in two days, in three days. That's not going to happen. What we're going to do is we're going to show you a path we're going to show you an avenue. We're going to show you a route that you can get better if you dedicate yourself to it, that you're going to have millions of little decisions, what you're going to eat, how much you're going to sleep, if you're going to you know, get along with your partner, um, how often you're going to shoot, what ammo you're going to use, what, how often you're going to carry, what gun you're going to carry, what sites you're going to carry. All these millions of tiny little decisions are going to contribute to that moment where you have to fight for your life. And uh, in that moment, what you do is not going to matter. What's going to matter is all the things leading up to that moment. Like how often have you trained? How much did you sleep? Um, how mentally ready are you there for that moment? You know, where if you're sitting in Boston watching your spouse run a marathon and you watch a dude take a backpack off and set it down and it goes off and everybody starts screaming, are you, do you got a tourniquet in your back? Are you ready to go? Yeah. yeah the personal responsibility is preparation and, and being ready. Always <laughs> be ready. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, if uh, people want to follow you and keep up with you, uh, where do they need to go? Well, you cannot keep up with me. You can try, but you will die <laughs> trying. <laughs> but, uh, everything for me is like the same. It's Tim Kennedy MMA. 
Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all the shenanigans. Um, like my caveat is like, I want one of those disclaimers where it's like, do not try these things at home, boys and girls, because you will die. Um, <laughs> this is conducted by a truly hairy idiot that should be dead. <laughs> Don't do this. Um, Besides the workouts, do the workouts, you know, follow the diet. Um, but if you see me set myself on fire and jump on an airplane, don't do that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> or, or, it may or, be entertaining, but it's not recommended. Or pass, or pass out from hypothermia. I saw that one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah don't do that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Terrible. Yeah. Well, hey, I, I, uh, I, I just realized that I talked about two of your fights, and they're both fights you lost. So I, gotta, I can't close on that. We got to, what's your favorite win? I mean, I think my, my favorite win. Uh, was the one time I didn't finish the guy. It was a, it was a my only decision win, and it was because it was a, just a battle. That was my favorite win. Uh, so uh, you got to have one like that too, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna totally go against you here. I'm gonna talk about my famous, <laughs> my famous and most favorite loss. Okay. Um, I had an amateur f- record of 30 fights before I turned pro. Wow. And um, the first fight that I turned pro, okay, nobody touched me as an amateur. I beat everybody and the dude I fought I had just beaten three weeks prior and my first my pro debut I lost I got throttled big huge cut um TKO stop uh stoppage by the doctor and um that's that was, that was Tim Kennedy who went on to be top 10 in the world for almost 10 years my pro debut um uh, that's my favorite fight yeah it- it's a place to, it's a place to build back up from. That's right. Yeah. That's Get awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Appreciate your time. I know you're super busy, but uh, appreciate you yeah. coming out and talking with us. Hopefully we can do it again. My yeah, pleasure. Anytime. Absolutely. Yeah, man. Looking forward to it. <laughs> For those of you that are watching and listening, if you're not already on YouTube, go to our YouTube page at Mighty Oaks and uh, you can subscribe there, like us, share this, comment. And uh, we'll get more content to you every Friday at 10 a.m. Thanks for watching.